All right, but well, let me go ahead and get started. I know there'll be more joining in just a minute, but again, we want, really want to welcome everyone. My name is Cindy Carlson. I'm um, clinical core leader at Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and have been part of the clinical task force as we've revised um, moving from UDS-3 to UDS-4. And what our clinical core steering committee has done is, again, through a survey we sent out earlier this year, gathered input from you all as well as, uh, as some of the director's meetings on what are some of the big topics that, again, are missing from UDS-3, which is what shaped um, development of UDS-4 questions, but then also what areas do people feel like they want to learn more about as we move towards implementing UDS-4. So um, as part of that, we're launching a webinar series. series. This is our first webinar, um, and it's building on what we presented the, at the ADRC meeting in the spring, and we're thrilled today to have um, Dr. Costas Lekhetsas um, presenting today, and he'll be talking about, um, again, on guidance on evaluating and um, documenting neuropsychiatric symptoms and mild behavioral impairment. So I know this is one of the areas that people have a lot of questions on. So we look forward to having Dr. Alcatsas um, present on this today. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first of our series. So we will have on March 22nd, we'll have the second of our webinars. So again, look for those notifications and that'll be on um, how to uh, work through um, di diagnosis and documentation of impaired, not MCI versus mild cognitive impairment. So that'll be our next webinar. Um, we also, for the ADRC uh, spring meeting, we'll be talking about disclosure procedures, which was the top choice that clinical core leaders and teams wanted to um, hear more about. So that'll be part of our spring meeting. And then a week after our spring meeting on um, May 15th, um, so mark your calendars on May 15th, we'll be having a training session um, let me make sure I get the date right. Uh, yeah, May 14th, I think it's actually it May 14th. May 14th. <laughs> sorry, thank you. May 14th. Um, on that Tuesday, we'll be having a virtual training workshop. So we really hope that this will be clinical core team members um, getting together. It'll be a virtual workshop, but again, um, getting familiar with the EDS4 documents, having a chance to run through them and get feedback and, and talk about how we're going to implement these, what questions people have. Um, we also, you'll be, you should be seeing emails soon about um, pilot studies that we'll be conducting that'll help us give it a better sense of how long do each of these elements take to um, gather data from the UDS-4. So we look forward to having a lot of sites participate in that so we can refine um, telling our participants how long it'll take, kind of streamlining staff burden with use of electronic data capture, et cetera. So um, again, look for the upcoming webinars. Um, our emails about the pilot studies for the different centers to participate in. And then again, our training session on May 14th, so a week after the ADC spring meeting. So with that, um, for today's format, um, Dr. Lekhetsis or Costas will be presenting on, um, again, neuropsychiatric symptoms and mild behavioral impairment. And then afterward, throughout his talk, if you have questions, please go ahead and use the, if you look at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A function. Let's see, is it down there? Yep. Um, so again, looking at the Q&A function, go ahead and enter your questions in as he's speaking. Um, at the end, you will have a chance to raise your hand and then also unmute yourself and ask questions. But if you could hold those questions to the end of the presentation, we'd appreciate that. So again, we're thrilled to have Dr. Cuts, Custis Lekatsis as part of our clinical core steering committee. Again, um, I think most of you know him, but again, he's Elizabeth Plank Alt House Professor and Vice Chair of Psychiatry um, in the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. He's been a leader in helping us to better understand neuropsychiatric symptoms and how they relate to dementia, and really has spearheaded us bringing in mild behavioral impairment into our UDS-4. So again, trying to better capture these subtle um, neurobehavioral changes that our patients tell us about, but that we haven't really captured well as part of the Alzheimer's Center's program. So, we're thrilled to have Dr. Lekatsis, who's everyone, everyone loved his presentation and, and um, the recorded presentation at the ADRC spring meeting. So now we get to have him to ourselves live. So welcome, Costas. Uh, hi, uh, Cindy. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everyone. I'm a little bit overwhelmed by seeing 209 people signed up. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to make this a good experience. Uh, my goal is to speak for about 35 or 40 minutes. It'll be an extended talk uh, from the one that, that had been recorded and was presented at the last ADC meeting. 
Um, I'm assuming that questions will accrue as I'm uh, presenting, and then we can have a conversation, hopefully, for the last 20 or so minutes. Um, my goal is at this stage to make sure that we're all on board with the ABCs of some of the new terminology that you'll be hearing and some of the changes in the forms that you'll be hearing. So I've decided to make this very case-based, um, which will give us an opportunity to think about issues as they relate to individual participants uh, and other patient and patients that, uh, that you see. Uh, so uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, okay. I'm imagining everybody can see this. Um, so why is this topic important? As, as I'll give you a little evidence in a moment, there's growing importance of neuropsych symptoms in the early phases of cognitive disorders. So immediately I'm making the point that we're focusing this discussion on a better elaboration of NPS. Um, so we want to strengthen the existing UDS elements around neuropsych symptoms, better capture data in people without dementia, and try and make some differentiations of age of onset. Uh, of the symptoms in simple ways. Um, the other thing that we are changing that uh, will take uh, a little bit of a learning curve for everybody will be to standardize the recording of psychiatric diagnoses. There's a lot of room to work around these. I know people sometimes can be intimidated when they hear about DSM-5, um, but there really is no other way of standardizing psychiatric disorders that we wish to report around our participants. Part of that discussion is to remind us that there's a difference between symptom, say the symptom of sadness or dysphoria, a syndrome, which could be a major depressive episode, and a disorder, which really is a very particular kind of syndrome with certain characteristics, impact on, on life and uh, not due to other causes and so forth. Um, so, and then we also want to incorporate the diagnosis of, of MDI, and I'll spend a little bit of time today talking about MDI. Um, you may have seen this before. We've been studying this, as Cindy said, for a number of years. We have a couple of population studies already um, converging on evidence that after the onset of dementia, neuropsych symptoms are universal. In the Cache County study, we showed in a, a cohort of people with dementia followed for many years that essentially everybody developed neuropsych symptoms at some point in the illness. Uh, and we also showed in the cardiovascular health study that um, the prevalence of neuropsych symptoms in MCI is on the order of 50%. There have been many replications of the MCI finding in different settings, and the ballpark ends up being about the same. So these are frequent universal symptoms in the context of dementia. Uh, the other uh, recent finding is this general idea that in some fraction of patients, the presentation of the later dementing disorder is neuropsychiatric. Many ways of framing this, the work that Lizzie Wise and our group did a few years back, I think is most informative in this regard. Let me see if I can summarize this. These were about 2,000 people in NAC who eventually developed uh, dementia. And we looked at the occurrence of neuropsych symptoms before. So uh, the red, each line here is one person. This is a subset of everybody. The red line is a period when they're being observed in somebody's ABC and they have dementia. The blue line is when they have MCI and, and gray segments is when they have uh, neither. Uh, so you see some people going in and out of MCI and the gray comes and goes. The hatch shows the periods where they have reported neuropsychiatric symptoms. And if you just focus on the gray zones, these are people who had a, a NAC visit before cognitive diagnosis at least a year before, and these individuals had neuropsych symptoms but did not have a cognitive diagnosis. And if you add this all up in a, a cumulative summary, about half of everybody develops neuropsych symptoms before MCI, if you look at all-cause dementia. And if you look at Alzheimer's dementia clinically diagnosed, it's about a third of people uh, who have neuropsych symptoms even before their MCI diagnosis. So this raises all kinds of interesting questions, but obviously is one of the reasons we'd like to improve the data collection as it pertains to the ADCs. Uh, lots and lots of us have uh, shown how the presence of these symptoms before dementia or even before MCI are associated with accelerated progression to the next phase. Some of the most important work in this area has been done by Jonas Geta, and I'm delighted, Jonas, to see you on the webinar today. 
I won't belabor the, the details. I think the replications are adequate that we can feel pretty solid that having these symptoms is associated with a faster progression to the next stage, whatever that might happen to be. Many years back, a, a group of us uh, came together under the Neuropsychiatric Syndrome PIA for iStart, and we felt like it made sense to start understanding whether there was perhaps a unique syndrome that was occurring before the onset of dementia that might characterize a typical syndrome, and you'll see how we defined it, but also be a better way of trying to define and understand the people who are going on to develop dementia at a faster rate. And this was a parallel idea to MCI, the mild behavioral impairment. Now, we use the term mild in the term because we liked, at the time, the parallel to the MCI, which was mild. But I want to remind everybody that there are instances of MBI where the presentation, at least from the clinical severity point of view, is not mild at all. So it's really uh, mild behavioral impairment refers to the fact that it's before dementia rather than uh, making the point that the psychiatric disturbance is, is always mild. So what are the uh, diagnostic criteria? These are uh, research diagnostic criteria at this point. And I'll just highlight a few elements. There are changes in behavior observed by patient informant or a clinician onset after age 50, and they persist for at least six months. Sorry about that. Uh, and they come, uh, we propose that they can be uh, occurring in one of these five areas, motivational, affective, impulse, social context, and abnormal perception or thought content. And obviously you see what the particular symptoms are. They are severe enough to produce at least minimal impairment in things like interpersonal relationships, social functioning, ability to perform in the workplace. So we're not really looking for impact on ADLs or IADLs in a direct fashion or well, perhaps more direct impact on how people relate to each other uh, in those in their lives for how they function in a social context. We expect that they maintain their independence. By definition, they don't have the dementia. So we may see comorbid psychiatric conditions of various kinds. So some people will have had major depression years back or an anxiety disorder. But we try to make the point that MPI is different so the clinician is called upon, and this I'm sure will be an issue for discussion, how do you tell apart if someone has anxiety in MCI at age 75 and they had an anxiety before, disorder before? When is it a recurrence or persistence of the anxiety disorder as opposed to MBI? We'll get into one of the ways that you, you can approach that. So MBI cannot occur if you believe that the active symptoms are due to a major psychiatric disorder, like major depression or anxiety disorder. And as I pointed out, they do not meet criteria for dementia. So these criteria for MBI have um, come into a number of studies, looking now more specifically at whether MBI is a predictor of progression. And much of the original work was done by Fernando Tarriano's group in Buenos Aires in Argentina. They had already done a study before the one that I'm showing you here. But this was a later study where they differentiated people with psychiatric disorders that were relapsing and still symptomatic versus people who had MBI. So they made the distinction in their study, and they looked at time to dementia, which is basically what the survival analysis is showing. And as you can see, in this context, people who had a psychiatric disorder that persisted or occurred later in life did not have a clear accelerated progression to dementia, not at least much higher than everybody else. Whereas the MBI group, so these were people who sort of very cleanly had these nuanced conditions that seemed to be very uh, related to their state in life. These folks actually had a faster progression to dementia than individuals with MCI with or without neuropsychiatric symptoms. There have been several applications in many settings, um, so from the point of view of comparing in someone who does not have dementia, whether they will progress to uh, MCI or dementia faster, uh, people with MBI go much faster than others with odds ratios on the order of two to three, uh, and in one example, as high as eight. Um, and uh, there's also in a subjective cognitive decline cohort in Canada, a suggestion that if you have SCT and meet criteria for MBI, so you progress in dementia to MCI at a much faster rate um, than you would otherwise. So again, this hint of interest as to why is this happening and uh, how can this 
help us understand the underlying biology and also potentially be a target for prevention. So what is our current approach in UDS3? Well, the first uh, piece that's necessary in every situation like this is to capture the psychiatric symptoms. In UDS3, they are captured three places, NPIQ, GDS, and Form B9. And they're captured in different ways. NPIQ is purely caregiver driven. It's basically what does the study partner report? GDS, depending on how the centers administer it, might be a hybrid where there is input both from patient, participant, and a family member, and B9, which is entirely clinician opinion. So currently UDS3, these are captured, and then these come into the diagnostic uh, discussion, and you as clinicians right now are called upon to decide if there's a so-called psychiatric contribution to cognition on D1, although there's not really a standard definition of psychiatric condition. What we are proposing now in UDS4 is to continue the capture of the symptoms as before. There will be modifications to B9 with cleaner definitions of psychiatric symptoms and cleaner timeframes about when we're asking you to decide whether an individual symptom is present. And we're looking to B9 as the place where the clinician might reconcile differences between caregiver report or patient report with a sense of clinician judgment. We're obviously focusing on individuals without dementia, and as you'll see in D1A that we'll get into a little bit deeper, we're looking to uh, decide whether someone who has the neuropsych symptoms has MDI or a DSM-5 disorder, or they have NPS that don't quite either fit a DSM-5 condition or uh, MDI, and that is a by default distinction. And we also have a, a little bit more cleaner now uh, addition of the various DSM-5 disorders and give you some discussion in the handbook as well as on the D1 form as to how to think about them so that you're not recording a, someone who's just sad for two weeks as having a depressive disorder, which wouldn't really fit the criteria. So let me give this to you in a bit more of a visual sense and uh, let's drill down a little bit more. So someone who is in an ABC is in one of these periods. They're either unimpaired, there's some kind of cognitive condition or prodrome, or they have dementia, and obviously they have a past history. But for our purposes today, this is the period of interest and observation. And many people during this time will present, they will have neuropsychiatric symptoms. You'll capture them as we said. They will have no prior history. This will seem to be something that's pretty new. And it's possible based on other criteria being met that a diagnosis of NDI will be appropriate. There will also be people who have neuropsychiatric symptoms um, who do not meet criteria for MBI. And that might be because there's no clear change. These might be aspects of their personality, for example. They might not be persistent in, in the last six months, and they might not be affecting function. And I'll give you a case example of that in a moment. So just because you have neuropsychiatric symptoms in this period of observation does not mean you have MBI. And there's also the possibility that someone who has neuropsychiatric symptoms, who had a, a history of major depression, perhaps the symptoms now are in fact either a persistence or a relapse of the typical depressive illness this person has had, and therefore they don't have MBI because their symptoms are due to major depressants. And it'll be up to you all to decide whether these symptoms are impacting on the cognitive disturbance uh, should there be one. Drilling down a little bit further, of course, you could have a situation where someone is followed as part of your center for many years, so they now develop major depression or a psychiatric illness that meets the DSM criteria. By definition, these are neuropsychiatric symptoms. They're just emerging while you're observing the participants. And so this person, such a person, would not have NDI because this is basically major depression continuing, simply showing up under, under your own observation. Uh, the um, other situation is that people could have major depression that straddles, uh, is recurrent. The example I gave you here is major depression that is late life new onset. This is major depression that has been lifelong. But it's possible to have major depression in the past. It's possible then to have neuropsychiatric criteria, but to decide that the person has MBI because and you'll see a case example, there are situations where it doesn't fit the idea 
that this is a recurrence of this person's typical depressive disorder. So they have major depression, they have neuropsychiatric symptoms during the period of interest, but they also meet MBI criteria because either all or part of the neuropsychiatric symptoms are not fully or adequately explained by the major depressive disorder. So let's get into a case study. This is the same case that I have different endings and variations as we go through. 72-year-old retired nurse, she's referred to the ADC, first visit, in good health, without significant comorbidity, no psychiatric or substance use history, in the last couple of years, been complaining of memory loss, trouble keeping track of appointments. Long story short, she gets worked up, she has amnestic MCI, and it's due to AD because she is a positive end of the disease. So in this particular instance, with a revised D1A, the first question is, does the participant have unimpaired cognition and unimpaired behavior? And in this case, the answer is no. She does not have unimpaired, therefore she is impaired. And does she meet criteria for dementia? No, we just said she has amnestic MCI. We also discovered this new participant that over the last couple of years, she's had notable changes in her mood and behavior that have fluctuated but are getting worse. She currently has anxiety, which is rated on the MPIQ with a score of two, similar for irritability, and she has social withdrawal as reported with a severity of five on the GBS. As a result, she stays home much of the time, gets angry when her husband encourages her and threatens him at times from divorce. The latter part is the impact on interpersonal relationships that I've been talking about. It's not just that she's symptomatic, but she is withdrawing socially. She's not engaged in her activities. She gets into fights with her husband. is somewhat suspicious. And so pretty clearly, the neuropsychiatric symptoms are impacting on her interpersonal functioning. So how do we rate this individual? So the, the, in this case, the family uh, notes a change in affect, uh, in particular in motivation. Symptoms have been present for at least six months. It's late onset after age 50, cannot be explained by delirium or the other psychiatric disorder. Symptoms interfere with at least one of these, in this case, interpersonal relationship. And she's largely preserved independent. She has MCI, and so that largely covers that. So does she meet criteria for MBI? Yes. And then you go on to select the domains. Uh, straightforward, I think, again, in her case, it's motivation and affect but impulse control, social context, and thought and content are all notes. So that hopefully is a pretty clean case, someone with MCI who also has MDI. Let's vary the ending. So she has the same level of symptoms, but these symptoms are not troubling and not affecting the life of the participants of her family. So in this case, she does not interfere with at least one of these. So she's got symptoms, they don't interfere, and so she does not have MDI. Study alternative ending two. Now she has a history of depression, so I should have changed the top as well, with onset late in her 40s. She's been under regular psychiatric care, and she has been doing generally well, although she's a little bit symptomatic, but she has symptoms. Her concentration is not very good, and she struggles to make decisions when her mood is low. So here we're getting a sense of someone who's always had depression, who's still symptomatic, and the kinds of symptoms that she has are very much like the symptoms that we see resulting from depression, poor concentration, indecision. If you want to call those cognitive symptoms, that, that's fine. Some people might consider them, uh, others not. The important point here is that her neuropsych symptoms in their entirety are explainable by major depression. So for her, you would say she does not meet criteria for MBI. And then at the end of section three of D1A, you would record her as having major depressive disorder, which is currently present. And because of the trouble with concentration and decision-making, which could be amnestic uh, type or executive impairment, you might record that these are contributing to the cognitive disturbance. So major depression, relapsing or persisting later in life, a person who has major depression, and there seems to be a contribution of this major depressive disorder to the clinical cognitive presentation. So, uh, case study uh, number three, she has a history of depression, onset in her 30s. She's been under regular psychiatric care, and she's been asymptomatic for a very long time. 
doesn't have any current neuropsychiatric symptoms. So you're gonna go straight to the back of section three. You're gonna to wanna to record that she has major depression. That way we will know based on all the other data that we've collected that this was a prior episode and this is not contributing to the MCI because she's not symptomatic. So lifelong major depression gets captured in D1A at the end in section three. Person is asymptomatic, so there's nothing to be sad about how she's doing right now. Obviously, it does not meet MDI criteria. Here's a somewhat more complicated case. Um, again, uh, she's good health without significant comorbidities, no cognitive complaint, unremarkable cognitive testing, cognitively unimpaired. So she has a history of major depression, onset in her 30s, uh, 28 years on sertraline, I picked sertraline because it was approved just around that time. And uh, she currently has some psychiatric symptoms. And she also feels tired, low, no longer goes to the senior center, less involved with family activities. So um, what do we say about this person? So does she have unimpaired cognition, right? She's cognitively unimpaired. The answer to this question is, she has a, a unimpaired cognition, but she does not have unimpaired behavior because she's currently symptomatic. So at the beginning of D1A, you will record no to this question, even though she doesn't have MCI and she doesn't have dementia. She does not meet criteria for dementia, so you will go on to question four, and you'll be asked the question now, does she have MBI? And the answer is yes for all the reasons that we were talking about. The psychiatric disorder has been in remission for a long time, and the phenotype that she has now is looking quite different from what she had before. So this is someone with a prior major depressive disorder has been under control, well-treated for many years, now appears to be developing something new, and it fits the MBI construct and meets the criteria. And again, you will pick your domains, which I chose them in this illustrative case to be roughly the same. And you will also record a prior history of major depression, but that it's non-contributing. I'm using major depression here as a common example. I think anxiety disorders is going to be the less common, but also not infrequent occurrence that you come across. So coming to pull this all together, what are we proposing? We'll continue to capture symptoms in these forms with the changes in D9 that you will be hearing about we're focusing on people without dementia, and we are making distinctions between MBI, DSM-5 disorders, and MPS, not MBI, or DSM-5 disorder. And we're getting a little bit more systematic about the contribution of DSM-5 disorders to clinical practice. Let me end there, and I think I accomplished my task. Hopefully, I wasn't talking too fast and trying to get to the end. I will stop my share. And uh, so should we take some questions? Yeah, thank you, Costas. I think um, so Jim Law had a question. I had the same question, too. I know he, early on you talked about um, the rates of MBI predicting conversion to um, dementia. And do you ha is, were there rates that um, for people who did not convert that were noted? Um, so I think it was like 55% uh, of people converting to MCI had um, or maybe as neuropsychiatric symptoms early on, and then 65%, I think, had um, symptoms before going from normal to dementia. Um, do you have, were there rates, like comparison rates for those who stayed normal? How many people had neuropsychiatric symptoms who did not present, who did not progress? To yeah, actually, I didn't do a good job in explaining that. These are not rates of people who progress. These are rates of people who eventually got dementia. What fraction of them had MPS before MCI. Mm -hmm. So it's about 55%, meaning 45% did not have MPS before MCI, all cause dementia. If you focus on AD, the rate is about a third, 33, 34%, as I recall. So no, they're, they're, the control is it doesn't fit here because you're looking back uh, to what happened to people under observation before, but we know they had dementia. Jim, I see your hand up. You want to um, follow up on that question? Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Casas. So the question was really among people who never. So we we collect the uh, the NPIQ on everybody, whether they're normal, impaired, whatever. 
So among people who are normal in NAC and were always normal in NAC, what proportion of those people had positive endorsements by their study partners on the NPIQ? You know, Jim, offhand, I don't know that number, um, but that is not the number that was being reported in the WISE study. It was, it was a different number. Yeah, John Brigman. Hi, yeah, this is great. Um, I have a question about the I, an example you gave, if I remember correctly, if I... You, you cited a patient that had an MPIQ positivity score for dysphoria, but then you stated that it wasn't MBI because it wasn't a change. Well, I thought by definition, the MPI caught things that were a change from some theorized ba baseline. Yeah, but then that's where B9 comes in. So the MPI will simply record whether the symptom was present in the last month. But when and, you as a and and represents a change from a prior level of a prior level, correct? Fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, you caught me there. Uh, you, you will. The point, the general point was this person has somehow reported dysphoria. So maybe NPI wasn't the right place um, because in, in these are theoretical examples that I'm just trying to get you to think about. But you're correct. Maybe this was captured on the GDS or by the clinician on B9. Um, but then you delve into it more with the patient and the study partner and you discover, no, this really isn't a change. That's um, another thing to, I think that needs to be communicated more widely is that the MPI is supposed to catch change. So almost by definition, if you captured on the MPIQ and you believe it's the, the informant reports that and you believe it's real, then that implies an M, a new onset issue or a change in a prior level and therefore really, this is this is the informant seeing it as a change right the individual might not agree with the informant because the informants are not always aware that is true <laughs> thank you <laughs> other questions or comments Rob, yeah. Yeah, so thanks, Casas, for a nice presentation. Hey, so Rob. my experience of the many different forms we complete is that the rules are various, mixed, um, incompatible, and that are just going to be are confusing to most people who are employing them. Um, and I'm just like worried now you've added a lot of logical kind of gates here that, and I just wonder what, what I don't know what the plan is to actually ensure that people apply all these logical rules in a way that's sensible. And I'm not sure this training is gonna be sufficient to get us there. And I'm just wondering your thoughts about that. Well, I, I think you're right. It could be that it's not sufficient. I, I think we're relying a lot on the flow um, that's provided through the form. So if you look at the new D1A when it comes out, because we spent a lot of time thinking about it and looking at the flow, my sense is that just following the instructions on the form will flow you through it in the appropriate way. And that if you have any questions, you'll be able to go to the handbook uh, to, to deal with them. But change uh, brings problems. So it could be that we, we will need to do more trainings and clarifications once we have more experience with uh, using these new forms. Costas, I think I'm dumber than everybody else on this call because I have another question. They, the the last scenario that you had is uh, is confusing for me. Um, so somebody who has a prior history of um, of depression um, and then is um, is cognitively normal, but then is showing some affective symptoms, some behavioral symptoms. What clue? What hints or suggestions do you have for us to discriminate that from? I don't know. Do uh, people who have depression have flare-ups of depression? How, how do we? How do I discriminate somebody who has a history of depression that's been well controlled, who's maybe just having a uh, downturn on her mood disorder versus somebody who's got MBI? Yeah. Well, that's a great point, Jim. So w one example, uh, and I set this case up. Uh, this is someone who had nothing for thirty years on sertraline. So. 
you're right. It could be that after 30 years, she is getting a recurrence on that. But that's part of the evidence for me is that the problem has been under control and in remission and has not recurred over many decades. Obviously, an extreme example. The other piece uh, uh, is that patients can generally tell things apart uh, to the extent that they can remember their depression. So you could ask the patient and the family, does this feel like the depression you had when you were, I forget what the age was that we put there, it was around age 30. And for the most part, I think patients and family members will, will say, well, here's why it's different. In this particular example, well, she's really irritable now, uh, whereas uh, way back when she was depressed, she was just withdrawn and sad. She wasn't cranky, irritable, or very anxious. It's those subtle differences in phenotype. And I'm hoping that that'll be captured on the B9, where we are now using pretty clear definitions of individual symptoms. So it'll allow you to talk to the patient to try and make the, the distinction. Maybe, Constance, if you want to comment too, I think some of these questions, um, again, what we tried to do within the clinical task force was to shore up things we were already trying to capture previously, but weren't doing in a, a systematic a way. So again, there's going to be some clinical discrepancies. You know, some people might say this is a flare of somebody's depression, or this is an, uh, someone else might label MBI, but at least we're capturing that, whereas before we weren't capturing MBI. So again, each of these steps are going to be hopefully refining the science and capturing more. Um, and then also within our um, with within our um, uh, uh, data capture. Again, we'll be we'll be hopefully putting within the instructions things that help you identify what the right answer is. You don't always have to go back to the instruction book, but we try to put simple things that'll help guide our teams, things we think people will want to refer to on a regular basis at consensus conferences or thinking through the case, hopefully right there. So it'll be, but it'll take some team training in consensus conferences to kind of go through. That's why the MBI criteria are listed there. So people can kind of get used to those again. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think, I think that's, I think that's right, Cindy. Um, that's Marcella, my Wisconsin colleague. Yeah. Hi, Cindy. I just have a quick question. So what about that participant that, you know, their study partner says no to all the B5 questions on the, the NPI and you ask them if they feel anxious or depressed, they say no, but they're sitting in the chair, you know, bouncing their leg, twiddling their fingers, rubbing their leg constantly. Like they just look anxious or they're talking to you and they're, you know, have that, uh, you know, fast speech where they are seem like an anxious person. So on the B9, I would put that they were anxious, but technically they don't have a diagnosis or they don't have any reported symptoms. So how would that uh, work? Well, this person has an observed symptom by you, the clinician. It is being recorded on the benign, benign form. One option you would have is to go back to the family or the patient and, and point out what you're observing and asking them to explain or clarify whether that's happening at other times in the last month or, or before that. Um, but you're right, this may simply be reported as a symptom of anxiety that you're observing, but there's not enough input of this happening um, when, when you're not in the room, so to speak, um, to be able to come up with a diagnosis. Uh, or to even start considering that it's MBI, because you really you really need evidence of persistence. Uh, it's not just enough for them to have the symptom when they're in front of you to call MBI. Yeah. But the default, so, yeah. sorry, just at this point, uh, the default is the way in the package of data, this symptom is being captured. And so I would sort of think about it as, as NPS, the not MBI and is not uh, a DSM-5 disorder. Adam, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about the NPIQ and, you know, related to this for even, I guess, even before this topic came up, you know, it's, it's it seems like, you know, it's used in multiple observational studies, uh, you know, in a way that, 
it wasn't sort of initially designed to to assess neuropsychiatric symptoms in cognitively unimpaired individuals and and so related to the you know the question of like well what's the you know relative to what um you know my understanding is that initially the idea was well relative to um you know before their cognitive disorder symptoms were obvious you know is this a new symptom and so I guess I've often wondered, like, well, how how should you know, there's really no instructions that I'm aware of, you know, of how you should administer this to people who don't have um, cognitive impairment, you know, MCI or greater. And and I'm hoping that maybe there can be some clarification of how we want to do that, um, because I, I think it's been vague, you know, for for years, from what I can tell. Um, well, maybe we have a slightly different experience. Uh, I, I don't believe the NPI instructions necessarily refer to a cognitive disorder as part of the question. Um, so I'm generally quite comfortable administering the questions as are um, to people who are cognitively unimpaired. And there's a lot of experience with that, including with the NPIQ. I believe what's used in the ABC is the NPIQ. Am I wrong, Adam? It is the it is the NPIQ, but I but I I don't feel like there are that there's um, clarity on you know what you know. So I think it says you know symptoms present within the last month, you know change from baseline, but but I don't you know the original NPIQ I believe was uh, you know symptom onset since cognitive disorder changes. So you know I mean I. You know, and I, I guess I appreciate that the NPIQ doesn't maybe maybe the NPIQ and the I have to look at the UDS template doesn't actually say that same thing as the original, um, but I do think that it's a confusing you know point for people is like you know change since what change since um, their whole life or you know change since a month ago. Um, it's, yeah, a, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, it's very vague, I think. Yeah, I, we, we might disagree a little on the degree of vagueness, but your point is well taken, and especially that it's being administered to, a, to an informant, which is why I think the B9 uh, comes into play, because it allows you as a clinician to make many of those judgments. Yeah, I, guess, I guess what I'm just saying is, I, I, I wonder if, you know, I think that probably the NPI is more administered more standardly when people have impairment. And my worry is that, you know, among, you know, um, people with normal cognition, I suspect there's a lot of variability in the way that it's administered. And, um, and I wonder if there can be additional guidance to, to help standardize that a bit more. Well, my guidance would be to focus on the past month uh, whether it's a change from the person's life. I, I guess you're, you're struggling with, is this different for this person or, and what does that right. refer? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it has to be a change, right? I, I mean, I appreciate that. And, yeah. and I think, you know, we, we, I mean, not that I'm, not that we're not using it in cognitively normal individuals too. And, and, and that's the sort of way that we think about it is, is this a change from their, you know, from their baseline, um, why don't you have a look at what's in the what in the chat right now? I don't know if you had a chance to see it with the way the coding guidebook gives guidance. The other thing too that we talked a lot about for the development of UDS four is, you know, there are some questionnaires, you know, whether it be MPIQ or others that were developed in certain subsets. So maybe for people you know older adults or people with behavioral symptoms that may not span across the normal you know, normal, normal span and then into their disease state or a certain age group and not in the younger. Um, so that's where we're hoping that people will use UDS4 data as a way to look at the, how do the symptoms plot against these scores, you know, you know, and using the data, the NAC data to say, you know, is this different in people with MCI and dementia versus um, cognitive healthy controls? So again, the, the whole goal of it too, is to have us as a Alzheimer's Center's program use these data to refine how we're asking these questions and um, characterizing participants too. So,
Yeah, thank you. But yes, the, the links to the form, the um, current versions of the forms is in the chat. So if it's the Hannah's posted a few of the ones that are specific, and then you can go to all the draft forms on the link and put in there to scroll onto the bottom. They have copies of all the forms to review. I, I'm seeing a comment from Paul Newhouse about one of the cases uh, that I put in there. And I mean, I, I, I guess the, this is one of the issues where even within psychiatry, we, we disagree. Um, I mean, my, my personal view is that just because someone is having depressive symptoms at age 80, and if they've had a history of major depression, to say that it's recurrent, if the depression's been in remission for decades and the person doesn't recognize it as being the same, you know, I, I don't think it's the same condition. But this is one of the things that we struggle with as a, as a field more broadly. So there's a question, is it true that if someone has had hallucinations lifelong and continue to have at the time of assessment, then you would say no in the NTIQ? Uh, I mean, I don't know how often people have hallucinations lifelong, but I would not say no. Well, I would not be recording the NTIQ as a family member. Would be. So um, it would depend, I suppose, on what the family member said. All right, and then um, looks like um, Sophia, you had some a question too about PTSD symptoms. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think it's great that uh, we're trying to move towards more diverse uh, populations. Um, but you know, I, I do I'm concerned that we're not going to be capturing PTSD. We might be getting like sort of segments of it rather than viewing that as a syndrome. And I just because I'm not expecting anybody to become a PTSD expert, I'm not either, but we want to involve veterans, diverse communities. Um, you know, we do start to see reemergence of PTSD symptoms. And sometimes it can be really hard to tell whether say someone's having a REM sleep disorder versus reemergence or PTSD or, or both, you know, without objective sleep study. So welcome, welcome your thoughts on, you know, I'm not saying we should redo anything. Will there be a place to comment maybe? You know, especially as these cases are taken to consensus, so we don't lose those nuances with these more diverse communities enrolling in our ADRCs. Yeah, so if I could answer that, I'm trying to screen share again and show you that the revised D1A form does have a PTSD diagnosis place where you can report it. Give me a moment to. Uh... Yeah, but then it gets more confusing, right? Because, you know, uh, late life stress disorder, you know, sort of rumination that borders on PTSD. So, I'm just wondering, you know, we don't want to make everyone trauma experts, but how are we going to provide consistent guidance or at least a consistent discussion at consensus, right? Um, well, I'll open to hear recommendations from you. Oh, no, I'm not an expert. I think we should find this is what I'm trying to gently hint at. I, I just, um, I'm just wondering whether that's something we should maybe seek guidance on if we um, I, you know, better than me, you know, I, I don't know if we have PTSD experts here. I just think it's something we should, I'd like to reflect on more at least. Fair enough. I, I, I'm not a PTSD expert, maybe a little bit more than others on the call, but yeah. Um, not sure how to address that. And I think the, you know, again, the, when we set out with the UDS4 data, we recognize that there's so many nuances across um, disease areas. So there's, you know, geriatric psychiatry is one that we're not gonna be able to fully capture all the different syndromes and factors that are going to affect someone's cognition rate of progression. So we tried to hit the big common ones. Um, and we talked about, you know, more detailed PTSD and other factors that affect veterans. We have a question that links now, whether someone was in the service, um, and whether they get care at the VA. So for the investigators who are hoping to delve into more research on impact of PTSD on cognition, that there'd be an opportunity for them to kind of link databases. Um, so there's those opportunities, but again, I think what we try to do is to have um, more of a big picture 
common factors and questions that could lead researchers to develop additional studies. So, you know, if someone wanted to better understand PTSD, that they could use this as a launch point to um, develop a study or an ancillary study to UDS data that would um, better capture that. And then to form UDS-5. Yeah, I just took a look at the B9 form in its new version, and it does not have depth on PTSD other than general anxiety. So uh, it, it is a deficiency, but I think the question is how how many different kinds of conditions do we want to capture, as Cindy's saying, and, and what's the so to speak so to so to speak price that we pay uh, or our participants uh, from the burden point of view to, to collect the data. Um, Costas, just to uh, respond, and Cindy, um, I just wonder if, you know, the interesting thing about the different scenarios you posed was, um, you know, there's a certain degree of subtlety and, dis and sort of judgment about how you code exactly these. And I just wonder, I presume that we will come back a year from now or a year and a half from now and basically sort of do almost a QA, QC process and look back at how these events were coded and then whether the criterion that are outlined in those forms really help us differentiate, like you said, pre-existing psychiatric illness from new onset MBI. Do you, is that they're going to be, I assume there's going to be a formal process to sort of look at how well these things are performing. So Paul, we haven't talked about that, but I love the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm particularly keen in that context to see how much variability exists across centers um, for, for their application. So, uh, I mean, Cindy, you're you're the chair of the um, clinical core steering committee. This sounds like a very good project for us to think of picking up. And uh, I, I think Paul is volunteering to help us. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, that's a great point because we um. We did yeah. talk about it that there, as we've gone through these forms, there's some areas that we're very curious about how they map onto these, especially these newer areas. And so that's where I think having, you know, investigators pick a question and help us refine, you know, let's look at how this maps, how these, you know, questionnaires we have map onto the diagnoses, are we missing things? Um, so I, I, there'll be some quality checks within NAC, but I think a lot of these questions are meant for, that's what UDS data is for, it's for people to investigate and see how do we better define um, the role of MBI or better questionnaires or validate different surveys. So that's a great point. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be very interesting to see, do people understand how to use the questions? Do we get the, do we get the data that we really hope to accomplish? And, um, you know, having been involved in scale development a little bit myself over my career, I, you know, this is kind of getting back to sort of beta testing and then gamma testing, you know, so is it giving us the data we want or is it, are, are the answers all over the place? So, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, over a year's yeah. time, we'll have several, yeah, oh, sorry. So yeah. Over a year's time, we'll have several thousand uh, initial and follow-up packets um that incorporate the new forms so i i love that idea yeah so we'll sign you up paul to do that analysis well no good deed goes unpunished right <laughs> other questions yes christian yes hi thank you Appreciate the presentation. So just to sort of from a practical standpoint, as we move uh, towards evaluating people who are not impaired, and sometimes they don't come into clinic or to uh, research without a collateral source, what is, I guess, the validity also of the NPI in that setting? And do we know, um, you know what can we do uh, if that's the information we have? Is that correlating well with... Uh, because I know MPIQ, sure, people were impaired and they needed somebody else. Yeah, so um, are there centers that enroll people without study partners? I, I thought, it, maybe I'm wrong, but certainly at our center, we don't enroll people without study partners. But if you have a participant who doesn't have a study partner, the MPIQ could not be obtained. So it would be up to you to record on the B9, which 
has items, the new BN, the B9 has items very similar to the NPI item definitions. And you'd have the GDS. So that those will be your tools in an unimpaired, in, in a person without a study partner to capture the presence of the symptoms. Okay. Yes, I think that may be an issue. Usually there is somebody, um, a, a, a collateral source that should be there. But sometimes with participants, as we're not impaired, they come in by themselves only. So that was part of a, you know, the question I had. But thank you. Yeah, you, you would capture the B9 form with B9 and GDS would, would be the way you would capture the symptoms. I, I can confirm that, you know, we have been told that we can enroll people without a study partner. So I assume that that's true everywhere. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's not preferred, but. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, we're getting to the end of our hour. Any last question before we do some, um, again, before people jump off, Hannah's posted in the chat again that we do have our next Clinical Course Steering Committee webinar. We'll be focusing on impaired, not MCI, you know, compared to MCI. So um, you can already, that webinar um, panel discussions already posted that Santa, Hannah's put the link in there and you can go ahead and register for that. Um, so again, we'll have, be having more discussions. Again, we will be... Um, having a UDS4 training workshop that Hannah's also put in the link there as well. That'll be on May 14th. So again, we really encourage you and your clinical core teams, your data teams, whoever's interested from your ADRCs, again, to look through the forms. We put the links in the chat, look through them, you know, and then we'll be sending out information about piloting these to those. Um, hopefully a lot of the centers will engage with the pilot testing. Um, and then also, um, you know, bringing the teams together to kind of talk about how to operationalize this in a smooth way. And then again, I mentioned the ADRC spring meeting, we'll be talking about disclosures. So having some speakers and panelists and um, participants talk about um, biomarker disclosures, which is part of our ADRC program, um, uh, new uh, requ requirements. So hopefully that will um, be able to, um, so we'll be able to, Sorry, this is a colleague's coming in. Um, so again, we'll be able to um, talk about that, share best practices, and hear from participants who are having disclosures made to them. So um, again, I want to thank Dr. Lekatsos for his time and um, his expertise. We are glad to be able to, again, the goal of this is to better capture things we've been trying to capture before. Um, and again, we will be hopefully through the um, instructions in the, in the manuals and then through those of you interested doing some studies and analyzing the data on how how do these um, data sets capture what we're, what we're trying to do. So hopefully people will have fellow students or other investigators who are interested in studying this. And, um, and they'll be, yes, and Nina's put in the chat too that there'll be FAQs. So as we get questions, we'll be um, posting that. So there'll be a lot of resources for implementing UDS4. Um, it'll be a growth, uh, you know, growth time, but I think we, We'll hopefully learn a lot from this transition. So thank you, Costas. Um, thank you, Hannah, for organizing this behind the scenes. And thank all of you for participating today. Have a good weekend, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.